Okay, the biggest differentiator between us and a lot of hospital and other healthcare groups that are doing the same thing is that we target our services more at the mass market. So no matter how poor you are, no matter how rich you are, we should be able to accommodate them across all our hospitals. What are the biggest challenges that you know you deal with? As Indians, we are not health seeking. Most of the people who end up in a doctor's office with some severe problem, whether it's liver failure, heart failure, kidney failure, cancer, they're most proud when they tell the doctor that this is the first time that they've ever had to come to a doctor. And it takes all the effort and all the energy for every doctor to prevent them from saying, and that's probably why you ended up with such a serious condition. You should have come up way earlier. I would say on a much grander scale, that is the challenge I've spent an inordinate amount of time trying to solve. And do you see uh, India as a, as a big opportunity professionally? Absolutely. This is one of the fastest growing markets. This is rapidly aging, rapidly growing. The GDP is growing rapidly. The healthcare needs are only going to grow. So healthcare services, you can't go wrong. Absolutely, you can't. This is one of the best places to build healthcare, but you have to understand how difficult it is to build anything in India because there's not a lot of stable support structure. Today we had Virain Shetty on the pod. Virain is the executive vice chairman of Narayana Health. Narayana Health is one of India's largest and most prominent healthcare organizations. It is currently valued at 3.3 billion. During a conversation, Virain walked us through his early life and what it was like growing up with a cardiac surgeon as a parent. We discussed what he learned at Stanford University, the challenges and opportunities for Narayana Health, how healthcare is evolving in India, his advice for Indians looking to move back to India, and much more. Now I bring you Virain. Virain, so excited to have you on the pod. Thank you. Look forward to being here. I'm looking forward to it, Virain. Uh, maybe a good starting point uh, can be, let's talk about, you know, your early life. Mm. Uh, what really, you know, shaped you the most uh, while growing up? What was the environment like? So my father's a very busy cardiac surgeon. And growing up as the kid of a very busy doctor, you get a sense for what a real work ethic should look like. Uh, doctors in India have very busy outpatient practices. They need to see a lot of patients and they're always on call all hours of the day, sometimes at night as well. And so growing up, I was witness to, you know, my father being extraordinarily busy, uh, very successful as well. But it gave me a sense of what this is what adulthood uh, would look like. And so I would say that growing up, the incredible amount of work that it takes to build anything was instilled at a very young age. Do you remember, Virain, uh, you know, an instant or experience that kind of like left a big impact on you while growing up? My father started his practice in the United Kingdom and moved to India in 89. And uh, immediately, like he was bringing in a specialty that wasn't very well known in East India. He was a, a adult and pediatric cardiac surgeon in a time when there weren't that many cardiac surgeons in the country. And so for us, while it was normal for my father to talk a lot about the kind of cases he was doing, the surgeries, and even for me as an eight-year-old, to see an uh, open chest, beating heart surgery, play around in the hospital, come visit him in the hospital, in his outpatient department as a young kid, I normalized that as a kid. But, you know, the older I got, I really then started to get a sense of how weird or maybe out of tune that is for most kids growing up who really don't get a sense of what their father's job is mm -hmm. and in that i would say that that is something that's quite different and has stuck with me the sense of you know this is what adulthood should look like uh, and i got a sense of what that is very early on and so that maybe made me a lot more serious than most of the kids my age because they were quite divorced from what their parents were up to mm -hmm. got it and Virain, uh, you know, you uh, ended up moving to U.S. Uh, for the further education. What was the experience like? Also, you know, maybe skill sets or a worldview that picked up, that you picked up over there, and that has really helped you as who you are, you know, who you become today. Yeah. I think this is the experience for a lot of Indians that go through the entire Indian education system. So I went through 
the normal ICSC, ISC program. And then I went to engineering in India. And that is one way of a very one-sided information dissemination combined with very frequent uh, testing to see you know, if you've memorized anything. So that's rote memorization. Uh, going to the US, the first and most apparent thing and one I felt I was extremely unequipped for was the Socratic method of discussion where you sit in a large hall and you're supposed to actually debate the teacher. The teacher introduces an idea and you raise your hand and then you have to talk about the concept that we just discussed. And I had 16 years of education before that where you were not allowed to talk in class, where opposing the teacher was considered the absolute cardinal sin and this was not something I was very prepared for. So my class participation scores for the first year subjects in business school, some of which as much as 50% uh, came from class participation, that took an absolute dive. Mm -hmm. And after the first three months, I realized that, okay, this, I, I better step up uh, because this is, a, this is a very different way of learning. And once you get into a groove of it, to be honest, like Indians have no problem adjusting to whether it's graduate school, undergrad, business school in a foreign context, because it's not honestly that hard. We can pick those things up. But it is a little bit of a culture shock, and it is something that gradually I see more and more Indian schools adopting this method. And that's why, so I put my kids in an international school because that's the way in which they teach. And I find that to be a much superior way of learning because it teaches you to question, to question your default question assumption, not just take any sort of fact as received knowledge. So it creates the environment of, uh, of, of, of giving outputs, not just, uh, you know, uh, taking it in. And, uh, and Burain, uh, you went to, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Wharton? Or, or where, where exactly did you go to? Oh, I wish I'd gone to Wharton. No, I went to a, a Stanford Business School. Got it. And, uh, and so what year, uh, Virain, uh you moved back? And how was it like for you? Uh, did you face, you know, any challenges early years in India or you were already prepared, you know, what's, you know, what's, what's in the, in the, you know, in the bag when you're back in India? How was it like in the beginning? Yeah. When uh, I really did want to do my undergrad abroad, but that option wasn't available to me at the time. But I always knew I would do some sort of graduate education abroad. I wasn't clear really about what I wanted to do because I come from a large family of doctors and my father had set up this healthcare enterprise. And so I wasn't a doctor. And so I didn't really know if I would have any place working in a hospital, not being a doctor. And so the idea was just to see what would happen, to go to business school, see if any opportunity would arise there, which didn't happen. Uh, from a combination of things that the things that I saw were not that interesting to me because I am very interested in healthcare operations and healthcare operations, especially in hospitals in the US, was archaic. And at the time, I was a little disenchanted with the state of um, health tech that was in the US. And this was uh, a long time. This was 2010, 2012. There weren't too many health tech companies and a lot of them were doing things that haven't really survived the test of time. So for lack of opportunities, I uh, moved back to India and that's, I made my own opportunities here working with my father and building the company. But, you know, if I had to do it again, given a choice, I would have probably tried to stay in a different context in a different country and work there for a little bit so that I would get a much better sense of how things work in a non-Indian context. Mm -hmm. Got it. And uh, so, you know, you, you figured that for you, the opportunity is back home uh, and was, uh, was joining uh the Raina was already the first choice or how how was it how was the you know the journey how how did it start and how has it evolved over the years Virain? yeah so it started when i was still in college now i didn't go to an iit i didn't go to one of the top colleges i went to a good college in bangalore but it's not one that took up too much of my day uh, the classes were quite liberal and the course curriculum i found it relatively easy so that left me with large blocks of time and any Indian parent, uh, if they see their kids lying around, they feel that they're, you know, getting idle and growing useless. And so they would say, you know, go work. And out of the option that were available, it was either my uncle's construction company where I spent, you know, some summers working or my father's hospital. And so the construction company I did for two years. And for the last two years, I said, I'll work in the hospital, but in an engineering capacity, which means generator maintenance, lift management, building bathrooms and such. Uh, 
post graduation again because I couldn't really find anything. I got placed in a so- in a construction company, but I wasn't too keen on joining that. I also got placed in a software company. I was not too keen on joining that either. So just out of lack of uh, alternatives, I drifted into you know my father's company. I wasn't the best equipped or the best person for the role I was given, but that was the job, and I did it. And it's so. I wouldn't say that a lot of planning went into my career. It's just a set of things I defaulted to, which is, to be clear, I have a lot of privilege. I come from, you know, a family that has means, and I could have done what I wanted, but this was something that I didn't take too much planning into, and I think that maybe, you know, God had plans for me that I would end up uh, doing this. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we we all know what Narayana health is. Uh, just, you know, for maybe... There might be few people who might don't who might not know what Narayana Health is. So give us a sense, Virain, what is Narayana Health in simple, uh, really, you know, uh, language, and then walk us through your journey. You know, yeah. uh, how did you start it? Where did you start? And you know, over the years, how have you evolved and Narayana Health evolved with you uh, yep. over a period of time? Yeah, uh, the simple answer is that we run hospitals. But my journey, starting from the engineering aspect and slowly moving into management, is also the journey of transitioning Narana from a company that runs hospitals to a company that manages healthcare. And uh, because I'm realized coming in and running the numbers that running hospitals is one in which you're limited to a very small segment of your customer journey, which is surgery, you know, getting a chest cut open, very intensive, very expensive. And you can deliver a great amount of happiness and joy to the people you're saving, but you're only dealing with a very small part of their lives. And the, my journey with NH is one of which we're trying to move downstream and becoming more of a total healthcare provider, looking at people much before they fall sick, when they're healthy, when they need checkups, when they take medicines, when they go for a primary consultation. And so I've been transitioning our company towards being more involved intensively with the people's lives at a much earlier stage. So my journey is one in which I've taken part in almost every non-clinical role in the hospital. And that is mostly these uh, administrative operational uh, things. The things I look at right now is more on a high and strategic level mm-hmm. and occasionally dip my toes into the operational aspects. But we're undertaking a very exciting journey right now to become a fully integrated healthcare provider. And what that means is that we run clinics, insurance company, and hospital, and it's all integrated into one single offering. So for a patient, it is seamless. We want to be the one-stop shop for all your healthcare needs. Now, the building blocks of that, uh, I've spent the last eight years putting that in place, whether it is a software system, whether it is a system of you know business processes, whether it's expanding into clinics and you know, getting ourselves publicly listed so we have enough funds to be able to do that. Those are the things I've been working on. Mm-hmm. Got it. And uh, Virain, uh, what is the scale of uh, NS today? Where are we in terms of, you know, number of hospitals, uh, number of uh, specialty cares that you provide? Uh, just give us a sense. Yeah. We have uh, 18 hospitals all across the country of various sizes. We have very large thousand bed hospitals and we also run very small hundred bed hospitals. We run a bunch of clinics as well. We recently got a health insurance license. So we've been rolling out since uh, last last month, a set of health insurance policies. Uh, We also run a hospital in the Cayman Islands. So this is a small outfit in the Caribbean that's focused on patients in the Caribbean and the surrounding areas. I mean, business-wise, you can go online and just look at our financial results and so on. But I would say the biggest differentiator between us and a lot of hospital and other healthcare groups that are doing the same thing is that we target our services more at the mass market. And we try as best as we can to be very reflective of the needs of any customer who walks in. So no matter how poor you are, no matter how rich you are, we should be able to accommodate them across all our hospitals. Uh, Virain, you know, before uh, our pod, I was doing my research, really understanding about the industry and, of course, uh, NH. Uh, you know, the way you have differentiated yourself, just you mentioned that we are catering uh, to the masses, which is you know, affordable health care. And you're able to do that by, you know, being innovative at reducing your own cost. 
Uh, Viren, maybe double click on that. You know, what does that really mean? And how, or let me, let's put it this way. How was it earlier? You know, how was the, the ecosystem like? And you yeah. came in and that's how you've really differentiated yourself. See, I would say the DNA of all of this goes back to Dr. Shetty. So he worked in England in the NHS and the NHS is a national government program. And over there, it doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are, everyone gets treated and it's completely free. But coming to India, he realized that everyone has to pay. So suddenly, healthcare is a thing that's only accessible to the rich. And that upset him a lot. It upset him not just from a sense of moral outrage, but it upset him because he could see all around him that every other services company, whether you're a restaurant, there are five-star hotels, and then there are you know these Urupi restaurants that serve very low-cost rice and dosa in Italy. Uh, whether it's shoes or cars or now mobile phones, there's something that's available for every price point. So he did a lot of reading, did a lot of research, and he figured that there are business principles that can be applied in the healthcare sector for the purpose of reducing cost, not just the one principle most hospitals tend to follow, which is profit maximization. I mean, you can always do that, but there's so much more. There's a simple calculation that you do profit maximization, you're catering to a very tiny segment of the market. As you try to get more efficiencies, you can cater to the bottom of the pyramid, as uh, this very famous business uh, book was written a long time ago, which featured us uh, among these other businesses that were trying to cater to the large segment. So I would say that if you start with the assumption that we need to cater to everyone, everything you think about what a hospital requires, you will relook. If you look at whether a fountain or whether a very fancy lobby or whether this very expensive equipment, is it required? And if you think that, yes, it'll help me attract rich people, that's one lens of looking at the way. Or if you say this very expensive equipment, it'll actually help me do more surgeries or more cases because it has a very high throughput. That's another way of looking at it. The end result is the same. You are treating people, but one allows one way of, you know, massifying it allows you to cater to a huge segment of the population. And so it doesn't matter whether it's digitization, whether it's process engineering, whether it's even looking at every single room in the hospital and figuring out how the space should be applied. This is something that uh, we always try to put the lens of high throughput um, and low cost. Got it. And Virain, to run, uh, you know, a hospital, <clears throat> you know, a company at that scale, what are the biggest <clears throat> challenges that you know, you deal with? Uh, and that's always a tough question to ask because I get asked by the investors, like, what is your toughest challenge? I would say, and if they list out five, I just say yes to all. And so the question is, what are my toughest challenges? It's, it's yes to all. It is finding out the viable business model, getting good doctors, you know, scaling, uh, challenges attracting talent, figuring out the payer relationships, building a brand, making healthcare as a uh, health, it's something that people seek because here's one thing a lot of people don't understand. Most Indians don't go for healthcare. They don't go for surgery. They don't go for a consultation. Most of the people who end up in a doctor's office with some severe problem, whether it's liver failure, heart failure, kidney failure, cancer, they're most proud when they tell the doctor that this is the first time that they've ever had to come to a doctor. And it takes all the effort and all the energy for every doctor to say, to prevent him or herself from saying, mm, that's probably why you ended up with such a serious condition. You should have come way earlier. But keeping that aside, as Indians, we are not health seeking. We don't seek out healthcare. And we don't have the answer for it. We don't know how to change the behavior of people to be more proactive about their health, to go for more checkups, to proactively look for the tests that they need to take, rather than wait for this very bad thing to happen. So. I would say on a much grander scale, that is the challenge I've spent an inordinate amount of time trying to solve. If it is solvable, I, I honestly don't know if it is. Everything else, how to make the numbers work, how to you know, scale, how to hire good people, those are just regular day-to-day, -day, those are called uh, easy problems. They're very hard, but we know the answer. And it usually just boils down to putting more money at it. But changing consumer psychology, to be honest, we, uh, we have no idea how to fix that. Changing uh, consumer psychology, psychology, uh, and we'll talk about, we'll pick up this topic in a bit. Before that, uh, you know, you've been building it uh, for the last, you know, uh, many, many years. Viren, what's something, you know, you know now 
you wish you knew later like you know one of the biggest lessons that was uh, at the same time was very expensive for you everything that looks like a good idea right now is going to seem like such a boneheaded thing 5 or 6 years from now it's a very expensive lesson we've had to learn again and again and it's the same the mistake that we make is assuming that it ticks all the boxes everything works out this is the perfect thing to do right now and 5 years later we go that was the absolute worst thing we could have done so whether it is scaling outside of our core geographies whether it is building too fast borrowing too much uh, divesting too early uh, hiring the wrong people who seemed right at the time these are just i would say that things can look perfect and tick all the boxes for a today problem but you know as a leader as a manager you have to be prepared that four or five years down the line this thing that you thought was perfect is going to be the one of the dumbest mistakes you made and not for anything else it's that the entire circumstances and the environment around you changes because the world doesn't say still your competition doesn't sit around you know not doing anything waiting for you to react and people's behaviors change the funding environment change everything changes and so it is impossible to model out the sum total of all the variables uh because that would be essentially like predicting the future there's no way you can do that but at least get a sense that everything you're doing what is the maximum amount of downside what is in the in the worst possible scenario you calculate that and then you figure is this going to be a career ending decision and if so probably don't do that but if not fine it's worth uh, it's worth the risk mm-hmm. you know so virain i think it's just a human nature that from outside uh people typically think that you know these guys are crushing it uh you know things are going amazing but a lot of a lot of the time success comes with a lot of highs and lows uh virain maybe we can talk about you know a story or an instance with you that was really hard for you and and you were able to figure it out uh and 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 you know once you did uh, you know you came through it and it provided you with a lot of confidence hmm. um so there is i mean there are many things that humble you as a senior person in an organization for us i would say that a couple of years ago we faced a major leadership transition where you know we had uh, one of our cxos uh, resign and leave to join a competitor and then we had to scramble like headless chickens in the last minute to figure out how we run our company how we source a replacement how we manage and this is a time when we are a public listed company and so one of the things you do as a public company is that you call your investors and you tell them see this thing has happened this very senior person has left but don't worry uh we've got it under control and one of our investors i don't remember who and i don't remember the exact words of what he said but he said something that sounded like to me like you guys even know what you're doing and that's the question that they all want to know that do you really know can i trust you with my money can i trust you that you guys know what you're doing and of course as you do like you mentioned earlier you always project this huge amount of confidence there's not a single startup entrepreneur who's full of bluster and full of confidence and saying we will conquer the world build a 1 trillion dollar company who doesn't cry themselves to sleep nearly every other night like there's always a lot that goes on behind the scenes and so i projected the confidence i said yes we know what we're doing but post the call when we actually tally down the list of things and how our company is scaling and where our money is getting spent and then in a sense that investor was right and at that time we really didn't know what we were doing we were building an unscalable business model for the business that we had which meant we were building lots of hospitals paying everyone the same amount paying the construction cost for us is the same as everyone else but we were charging people half of what on average people were paying half of in our hospital than what they pay everywhere else so the numbers simply don't square this is not one of you know this is not one of those things where if you do it at scale you'll suddenly win no because scale means your complexity goes up as well ours is a services business there are no returns to returns to scale for manufacturing and for digital businesses it's not for ours a service more patients equals more doctors more nurses more everything and then with more people you have you need to hire more managers more ways of linking all of that together and that's when i had to take a step back and realize this is clearly not working out because this amount of scale will actually kill our company we would be completely unviable and we will never be able to achieve 
my father's vision of being able to scale across the whole world and reduce the cost of healthcare. And so we took a step back, looked really at our operation and figured out we have to cut costs by a lot. We have to improve the patient experience by a lot. We have to retreat from certain markets where we thought we would crush it. And it was tough. It, it was absolutely painful. And a little bit after that, COVID happened. And that became a whole other set of challenges and a whole other set of risks. But it was an important journey uh, for us to go through. And I wouldn't say it's solvable. It's still very much a work in progress. The journey of trying to find the perfect business model is something no entrepreneur or leader will ever have completely solved. Because like I said, the environment, the world, your competition, the people you work for, everything keeps changing. Mm -hmm. So we're still on that journey. We're still better equipped. But of course, we'll face way different challenges in the future. Yeah. So <clears throat> Viren, in a world where you know, things are changing, right? Uh, nothing is constant, as you said, you know, whether it's management team, competition, or other external factors. What is what is your compass uh, that kind of like, you know, holds you tight or, or not tight, like, you know, uh, that gives you, you know, more of like a, a stability? Hmm. A couple of things. And a lot of this is borrowed wisdom from people who've come before me and I've heard. So one thing is, whatever you do, you maximize for uh, being able to sleep well at night. Uh, there are lots of shortcuts you can take in any business. There are a lot of ways in which you can run your operation that give you a short-term boost, but compromise on either your moral integrity or your financial integrity and so on. So do the things that allow you to sleep well means run a good business, run it honestly, decently, run it well, treat people how you would like to be treated so that you can sleep in peace. So that's, I would say, one of the guiding anchors. The other thing beyond that, uh, you know, that Peter Thiel saying, do hard things. Uh, why do hard things? Because all the easy things, someone's already doing it. And if you do an easy thing, the profits in that are competed away. And so there's one, you don't get any moat in doing an easy thing. And uh, it's relatively easy to replicate. And someone is always willing, if, if the business you're in, is selling, uh, you know, 100 rupee notes for 80 rupees. Someone else can always sell it for 75, 60, 50. It's a race to the bottom. So do hard things because while no one may understand it, appreciate your customers may not understand. Once you figure it out and get it right, no one else can do the hard thing. Mm -hmm. And that gives you that much more of a foundation in which to build something great. Yeah, got it. So you mentioned a couple of things, uh, Varane. One is, you know, the ultimate goal is to you know, build a full stack healthcare provider. Uh, and secondly, you know, you want to uh, expand it uh, globally, you know, would love to understand from you what's, you know, the, the, the vision or the ma magical outcome that you hold and the team at uh, Narayana Health holds for you uh, in, let's say, a decade to come. Yeah. The magical outcome... See, uh, our business, the healthcare business, is in easily the top three industries in the world. The total size of the global healthcare market is four or five trillion dollars. It's, it's crazy. It's a huge amount, and countries spend huge amounts of their GDP in providing healthcare. And it is the most pressing concern because, regardless of climate risk, regardless of all of that, people are living longer. And the entire global economy was shut down because of a health risk, which means if one has to prioritize, do you want to keep the factories open or do you want to keep people healthy? People always choose keeping your friends and family healthy. So it's clear that health is the number one priority for the world. Yet in healthcare, you don't see any company dominating even 1% or 2% of global health in a way that, you know, you have Apple with 40% of global smartphone market, Nike with 30% of global shoes, McDonald's with 10%. I'm just making numbers up, but you understand what I'm saying. Like in the service industry, you have gigantic globe-spanning multinational corporations in a way that doesn't exist in healthcare. Very local, very fragmented, uh, very bad economics. A lot of healthcare businesses are non-profit, not because they don't want to make profit, but they don't know how to make profit in there. So our aspiration is to build a business that scales across the world by making it standardized, by lowering the cost, by bringing more efficiency, by building something that it doesn't matter if you're in India, China, the West Indies, Brazil, the US, UK, it doesn't matter. We have to build a model that 
scales around the world. So it's a very, you know, uh, ambitious, bold thing. I don't know if we'll achieve that in my lifetime, but that is the thing we're working towards, not just number one market share in Bangalore or India or Asia. Yeah. As Peter Thiel said, do the hard thing. Uh, that's what, you know, you're going after the rain. And, uh, you know, would love for you to uh, kind of give us a sense, Virain, how healthcare in general in India has evolved over the years and, and you know, what are the opportunities or challenges uh, that you foresee down the road? Yeah. So uh, I said earlier that Indians are not health seeking. That is today. When Dr. Shetty came back from the UK, offering heart surgery, most people did not go for heart surgery. When you were diagnosed with a heart ailment, you just thought, okay, I'm going to write my will. I'm going to get my daughters married. I'm going to divide all my assets because I'm going to die soon. The idea that in the 1980s that you could get heart surgery and that will solve your healthcare problem was very new. And so from there till today, where if we tell our patients, you don't need surgery, you don't need stent, this medicine and this lifestyle change means you don't need to do anything, you don't need surgery. We actually have a harder time convincing people you don't need surgery than in the 30 years ago when you had to convince them to get surgery. So that's been a radical change. But I would still say that there's a long way to go for that, in that there's still a huge amount of work involved in being able to do that at scale because if hospital becomes the primary way of growing a healthcare business, hospitals are damn expensive. It costs two crores per bed to build a hospital. And if every city, every small town, every village has to have hospitals to fit everyone, there's simply not enough money in the whole country to be able to do that. So the challenge is scaling what we have, downsizing things that don't require hospitalization, being able to provide that online through app, digitally, clinic, home delivered, whatever that is, and to have that all work as one. Because right now we leave too much of that decision making up to our customers and the customers don't always prioritize that. Got it. And uh, Rain, you know, the podcast is around uh, really, you know, India is, is ascending. Uh, you know, the data shows that. Uh, even the energy among people, aspiration among young folks in India and the country is, itself is super young. You know, what advice would you give to folks who are thinking about uh, moving back to India? So a lot of people who go to Stanford and they have worked in the US for a while and they want to work somewhere in healthcare and they usually end up getting referred to me. Uh, and the advice I always give them is don't expect like that movie Swadesh where you come and there are people waiting at the airport to say, oh, thank God you're here. We were waiting for you. Now, please come solve all my problems. Don't come to India because you have a sort of God complex or a savior complex and you think that all the problems of India have been waiting for you and you and only you can solve that. That's simply not the case. In India, we've got millions of entrepreneurs who are extraordinarily talented, extraordinarily hungry extraordinarily incentivized to fix it. So, you know, for the ones who are planning a US return, it's not just going to be a noble mission. Because the fact is, if you are used to a nice quality of life, a stable job, a nice house in the suburbs, clean air, a five minute commute, good schools for your children that you can afford, not a, none of those things are available to you unless you're at the top 0.1% of the population. So for me, it is a no brainer to move back to India because like I said, I'm privileged. I have that all available to me in a way that it is not available for a lot of people. Like. So I would always tell them, be very strategic. What are you coming here for? What are the opportunities you're going to do? You're going to build a company. Great. What are your networks? How are you going to fund this? Where are you going to start? Are you willing to take a step down in your income level? Because it's, you're going, if you're an entrepreneur, you're not going to be paid very well. Or if you're coming to join a company, Indian companies don't work like Western companies. We don't respect the nine to five. We don't respect the no emails after five o'clock. You are work, you're on the clock nonstop because that's how fast you have to run to be able to thrive in this environment because it is absolutely brutal out here. 
and in a good way because that's what our country needs. And so keep all of that in consideration mm -hmm. and then you make a call. Is it the best thing for you, your family, all of that, that you come here and uh, build something? Got it. And do you see uh, India as a, as a big opportunity, uh, Virain, give uh, just, you know, professionally? I won't know about the other industry, but for healthcare, absolutely. Mm -hmm. This is one of the fastest growing markets. This is rapidly aging, rapidly growing. The GDP is growing rapidly. The healthcare needs are only going to grow. So healthcare services, you can't go wrong. Absolutely, you can't. This is one of the best places to build healthcare. But you have to understand how difficult it is to build anything in India because there's not a lot of stable support structure. We don't have a universal payment system over here. Everyone's paying out of pocket. So they have a big choice of whether they pay you or not. The regulations, the sheer amount of startup cost it takes to build anything in the brick or mortar businesses is very hard. And a lot of entrepreneurs will take a shortcut. They say, no, I'll build a fully digital business. Great, build a fully digital business, but have fun trying to convince people for whom, even if they have smartphones, don't know how to download, install apps and are not used to accessing healthcare to the phone. Healthcare is always accessed face-to-face -face upfront. That's people's default behavior. The time it will take to change default behavior from doing it physically to doing it online, it's the e-commerce story. You start out as Flipkart in 2006 or eight, I forget when, it doesn't become default behavior till 2017. So that's 11 years of plugging away at the same problem again and still negative unit economics. And so if you can survive that long, if you get that much funding, great. But it's not uh, that easy, but it's still, I would say, one of the best industries to be in. Yeah, uh, massive opportunity, but you know, ensure that you're coming back for the right reasons. Yeah. And, uh, and Varen, with this, we'll uh, transition into our, our last part. Uh, as uh, you know, warned you in the beginning that you know the Fanzo in the bag is coming, uh, it's coming ahead, coming up, and uh, so what he wants to get to know you outside of work. Uh, Viren, what's your typical day like from you know really waking up to uh, going to bed? Sure, I get up by around so the alarm goes off at 5 a.m. But the gap between when the alarm goes off and when I actually get up, there's a good 15, 20 minute lag over there. Uh, I try to exercise in the morning and then I see my kids off. Then just bath and breakfast and I head for work. And then that's it. I mean, my day begins and ends with work. I work till six or seven. And by the time I head home, the kids are ready to go to sleep. I'll again try and catch up with email or any calls. Usually a lot of international calls get scheduled for the evening and then just crash. Like I don't have much of a life outside of, you know, working and my kids. Mm -hmm. Got it. And uh, Virain, uh, you know, if you had enough, uh, I would say, attention, money, resources, uh, for the time being, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's put uh, Narayana Health on the side. What would you work on? But you're saying not this, but not I wouldn't, this. not healthcare. Yeah. Uh, do I need to make a good business out of it or I'm just, you know, you're free. Look, away you my have money. enough money, you have enough resources, you have enough attention. So I don't need to any return on that money. No. Then something in education. I would probably build a university. I would build something equivalent to, you know, the colleges that I went to in the U.S. I think there's a tremendous hunger. I read somewhere that among the top five uh, reasons for FDI outflow, that is after oil and semiconductors and all of that, easily the top five FDI outflow is higher education. So I think that doing something of that nature uh, in India is like, if I don't need to generate return out of that, I would, that's what I would do. Mm -hmm. Got it. And, uh, Virain, you know, you, uh, you provide health to, to people. What's your relationship with health, your own health? Yeah. So you can't, uh, work in a healthcare system and not look around and see the patients and see, you know, all the things that can happen to you. Uh, here's the thing though, the, the misnomer that if you think your typical heart patient is fat and overweight, uh, actually not the case. 
the with the BMI has a correlation with heart disease, has a correlation with all the other things, but it's not the only determining factor. There is so much more than that. Most of it is genetic and uh, lifestyle and the fact that, you know, the environment and diet is not so great in India. So I know what my risk factors look like. On my mother's side, uh, you know, a lot of her brothers and cousins, they all have heart disease of one kind or the other. A lot of them have heart attacks. All of them eventually, uh, you know, die of heart attacks and diabetes. So I know that on one side of my family, like diabetes and cardiac diseases is inevitable. And on the other side of the family, it would be things like hyperthyroidism, dementia, and that's all. So these are the known risk factors. So I can't act like I will be immune to all of that. Absolutely not. But it involves being a lot more aware. And so being aware means you watch what you eat, watch what you do, keep getting tests. The blood test in India is so cheap and it's so easily accessible. So I test frequently, uh, more than what is recommended. And, uh, you know, you and I are both using the standing desk. So this is one of the advice that all our doctors have started to give. And so the, the rule is uh, for calls, you stand up. When you're meeting and actually sitting down to type stuff, you sit down. And so you get like a 50-50 or maybe 60-40 split between your day when you're just standing around, pacing around, and that gets you these small things. Because I don't always get a lot of time to exercise, and I don't think most people do either. It's not so easy to carve out huge chunks of your day of exercise. But in the office, at work, take the stairs, you know, eat the right things, avoid things with sugar and stuff in them, and just walk around, and you'll get your 10,000 steps. Let's say just be conscious and, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to be a patient in my own hospital. And so I, you know, so I would say that as much as this is a service we provide for all our customers, the next transition of our business is to make sure that this doesn't have to happen. We will take care of your health at home, online, so on. You may not need the heart surgery, but you need to be more proactive about how you take care of yourself. Got it. And Virain, a hack that you can't live your life without. It could be personal. It could be, it could be personally, it could be professionally. A hack. Mm. Uh, I would say uh, read a lot. It's not a hack, right? I think everybody knows this. Just read a lot. But the minute you read something and you find it boring, just throw the damn book away. Just no book is, no bad book is worth, you know, stressing yourself over completing it. So, you know, read the book, but give it up if you find it to be too boring. Uh, it helps because... There's so much you will never get to experience. We, most of us are going to work only maybe a handful of jobs in your whole life. So you won't get the full depth of human experience just by uh, living life and experiencing things. Very few people are privileged enough to have a wide exposure to how people think, how people act, uh, all of that. So for those who don't, who are kind of stuck in one place and doing the same thing, reading opens you up to the world. And so that's a lot like traveling. It's a lot like talking to people you'll never meet. Uh, it's a lot like opening up your mind. So I would say that reading has helped me a lot and I'd recommend it to nearly everyone. Yeah. And what are you reading uh, currently? Uh, so the thing about reading is that it's constant and nonstop. I recently finished a book about the evolution of language in primitive societies. Uh, it's called Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes. And this is a story about... Uh, this guy who goes to the Amazon rainforest as a missionary, his job was to first convert them and tell them about Jesus and stuff. But he goes and he finds that even though they live like primitive, you know, they're very primitive, he found them to be the happiest people on earth because all their needs are taken care of. So he spends a lot of time studying their language and realizes within the keys of their language, he finds why they think a certain way, why they're so happy. And it's just, it has really nothing to do with my job or anything, but it is a very interesting book. So I just finished that. Yeah, it sounds interesting. And one last one before yeah. we let you go, Virain. Uh, we know you as a healthcare professional. What do your friends know you? Who are you for them? What do my friends know me as? Yeah. Like an incredibly boring, self-serious person. Like why they put up with me is just a wonder. I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a bunch of people who can tolerate my presence when I'm around. But... Uh, yeah, I would say that they, they tend to think I'm kind of full of myself. Virain, thank you so much uh, for, for doing this, for taking out the time uh, and, and coming on the part. Really appreciate you. Great.
Thank you.